this is going to be easy because number 19 failed, so we'll not talk about that. We will talk about uh, 20, and then 21 and 22 were also in the other pile. So then we'll, guess what, go back to page one, start in all over again, and just do things in numerical order till we're done. Does that sound like a plan? Is it okay? Mm -hmm. All righty. Uh, we're open for the Charter Commission to the establish a future Charter Commission question. And I'm ready for any kind of comment, uh, question, or observation, whatever it is out here. Well, um, week was that We understood that the school board had the ability and the right to ask or to propose an amendment at any time. Do you remember the number required? Uh, two thirds. <laughs> okay. Six. No, I'm going to keep coming back to that. It was right, six. Okay. Right? Yes. A five. Yes. So yes. Six. I'm sorry, it's a te it's teacher in me. Yeah, I, I know. just wanted to check. <laughs> and that, so in part because of that, we talked about the fact that, or maybe not because of that, but in addition, we thought that maybe, or some of us did, that having a goal, having a 10-year goal to ensure that we would provide an opportunity to make this review was a good idea. So you have two things. The school board can do it anytime they want, but need a high bar to do it and also it takes a lot of work to get that together it would have to be something important so our some of us felt that the idea of having a 10-year goal was a good idea okay mr Ardinger. i want to thank everybody for accepting my apologies for absences at the last meetings i appreciate that very much um I did follow on YouTube, so I'm caught up with oh. the presentations. Oh, well, you're a glutton for punishment. <laughs> um, and I saw this one start to get discussed. Uh, on, on this question, I've heard some testimony that, hey, the, chart, the, the school board could have acted pursuant to the power if there was any charter changes that were needed. And they didn't. Well, I, Ten years ago, the state statute, I saw as actually Tracy said, boy, this is a confusing set of petition requirements. Well, unfortunately, that is verbatim the language from the state statute. And in fact, as we went through this process, the attorneys involved in the Secretary of State's office said, don't, don't make a bunch of changes because we know what 49B, chapter 49B says for the legislature. By the way, if you went and looked at all of the RSAs, Tracy, they would, almost 85% of them fail to pass muster of your decent and excellent reading uh, <laughs> ability. So they are messy. But I wanted to address that point that was made, that at that point we kind of got nudged a little bit through the process to keep it like the staff. RSA chapter 49B and, and, that, and, and that. The second thing about this is when you establish the normal rule in 49B is there is no future charter commission automatically established in charter. What happens is 49B gives two avenues of getting a charter commission elected. One is the school board and that means we're going to do it with six people, which is not hard when you're dealing with some of the issues. It could be hard with, with others. The other is the petition process, which I want to acknowledge Tracy's comment again. She's <laughs> right. It's not the easiest thing in, to read, but it is consistent with the state statute. Both of those avenues are available all the time. And in almost all of the other municipal jurisdictions in the state, that's what you rely on, that you rely on these local charter options. You don't set one out there 
automatically in 10 years. You rely on the local people at the time at, and as the issues arise for what happens. Um, I know this, the charter commission process costs the school district a lot of money. I don't know exactly, but I do know from last time, and I'm looking at Lyndon, that when we looked at this, the city clerk works with the school district and the clerk of the school district to get everything right on the ballot, but they charge for it. And that election process is about 30 grand, hmm. as I remember that. So a charter commission, when you call it, whether you're the school board, whether you're petitioning from the public, or whether we're installing it automatically in the charter at some future point, has a cost associated with it. it is, it's my view that we established the 10-year future one the last time because it was the first time mm -hmm. this community of voters took control of the charter. Mm -hmm. And that we said, boy, let's not leave this to chance. Let's see it again. We've gone 10 years, and we've done pretty well. I think the school board didn't choose to do some of the amendments we're looking at, maybe in part because they knew there was a charter commission coming. And so to some extent, setting a third method out in an automatic period, which is not tied to the way the community is going, might alter the decision making of the current school board or the community at large doing a petition. You could see people trying to say, we should really change this. Well, we got a charter commission automatically in two years. Let's not do it because we'll have the double the cost. My position on this as one member would be for these reasons not to install an automatic charter commission call in the charter. It would be to leave it to the current uh, the, the, the 49B things, which is uh, there's not one time that you'll hear me object to Tracy's <laughs> co correct reading. It is messy, it is legalese, it is clumsy, it should be drafted more. I'm a tax lawyer, my entire life has been spent with statutes like that, and I'm sorry about that, it just happens. But I would leave it to those and <clears throat> not do that, uh, have an automatic one. Thank you. Yes, sir. I was say, Bill, I'm a trial. <laughs> <clears throat> I'd like to uh, just echo what Bill said about last time and why we set up a mandatory 10-year. Um, in retrospect, I think uh, it was a good idea. Not brilliant, but, but good, uh, because a lot of things have changed. And when you first try something, it's sort of like, you know, uh, putting the furniture in a new house, you put it in a certain way, and uh, you may like it or you may not, and you want to reserve the right to switch it around a little bit. And so <clears throat> I sort of uh, uh, look on this as rearranging the furniture after we have a period of time. Um, as to how we handle it going ahead, uh, I'm not sure. I, I find Bill's arguments quite compelling, but I heard other ones the other night that said something quite different. So uh, air it out, folks, air it out. I okay, remember uh, we had the attorney in here talking about these and, and everybody thinking, well, maybe we could tweet it or change it or something like that. And then we, as a group, thought the easiest way to get this part, because at the end, someone checks to make sure you're following all of the rules and regulations, was to go with, with the state regulations. And uh, I, I was kind of up in the air about the 10-year thing, but uh, I, I'm listening to Bill. I, I agree, Bill, that, that uh, if it needs changing, there's a pretty simple way to do it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, why spend the money and effort just to do it? Um, I understand why we did it last time, but I'm, I'm okay with not doing it again. That history was very helpful. I did not. <clears throat> um, districts, you're saying, do not don't do it. And that's, that's also helpful to understand. Yep. So we've graduated to that lofty spot. <laughs> well, um, one thing that I 
favor as far as not putting in a mandatory 10 years is that um, it, it puts the onus on two other parts of the educational system that are very key. Uh, one, of course, is the school board. And clearly, if the school board members see something that's totally out of whack in, in connection with whatever new things come out, then they have the right and the responsibility mm -hmm. yeah. to bring it to attention. And then the other thing is, um, sometimes I get dismayed with this uh, community because the community has a right and a responsibility to, to uh, demand things of the Concord School Board. That, you know, if people get up and, and promise the moon during their campaign and then they just completely forget about it, people should call them on that. And the same thing is true here that if uh, the members of the community, the voters, the taxpayers, um, see things that uh, from their point of view, and that I hope of as a uh, supporter of, of public school education, that they too would have a, a way, an avenue to approach an adjustment. So uh, with those safeguards, because uh, we can't guarantee that either one of them will take place, I'm not pretty. I'm not very good at predicting human behavior. Uh, it, you know, it just doesn't work, and and you can't plan on it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, sometimes you want to plan just the opposite, and you might be right if you're a betting person. At any rate, uh, I I see that there is a responsibility uh, to the community and to the school board to take care of matters that we can't. Mm, clearly see, I don't have a crystal ball that lets me know what might come up. So with those two safeguards, I have a certain comfort level of uh, not saying, okay, we're going to change the furniture 10 years from now. Lyndon. Um, after the first charter was accepted, um, Roger Phillips and others noted that there were some things missing that needed to be fixed fairly soon. And in Section 8 of the Charter, it says action by resolution, Section 9, general powers. And therefore, the board, the school board voted uh, back in June of 2013 to set the filing period and filing fee of school district elections, um, the duties of the clerk, the compensation of the clerk and school district treasurer. And by this, I mean to say that the requirement for financial disclosure could be made by a resolution of the school board under the charter. Oh. And maybe other some of these other details as well. Yeah. It's possible to do it that way. Okay, Bill. So I, I, I come at it from a slightly different approach from Bill, although I think I come to the same place, which is charters should be difficult to amend. The, you can think of what this country would look like if we had a mandatory 10-year constitutional convention <laughs> No. To, to change the constitution of the country. And um, we've spent some time in this Charter Commission talking about what would happen if groups of individuals on from one end of the political spectrum to the other were able to control school board races, et cetera. If you've got a 10-year automatic charter review, you're just begging, in my view, for people who are unhappy for maybe, well, it's it's hard to do, so you wouldn't necessarily be able to do it. But if you if you have the automatic 10 year, all you need to do is run the right group of people for the Charter Commission, and you can cause enormous amounts of mm -hmm. havoc. Um, I frankly think that we have some evidence as to why a 10 year review of the Charter is not needed, and that's the empty room. Right. Yeah, um, right. we, we've, we've, if, if things were wrong with us that people want to change, they'd be here clamoring about it, and they haven't been. So I think yep. if people want to change it, there are vehicles to do it. Those vehicles may or may not be difficult. They're more difficult by petition. But um, this is one area in which I'm very conservative. I think you set a, you set a governing document and you stick with it unless you need, unless there's mm -hmm. some fundamental reason to change it. So I, I, I would not, I think we should take it out. <laughs> so I, I would, yeah, Tracy. the only thing I, I, I'm really sort of having a trouble with is this, that there are, yes, I, in theory, there are two avenues to petition. 
In reality, I don't think there are. I think that the average Joe citizen isn't going to be able to go through the petition process unless they have legal counsel working with them. And then I question whether or not the school board would real it would go through the petition process not because they don't have the ability, but because of how the optics of it. If you're looking to switch how you're elected or you're looking at things like stipend or you're looking about those things, and we've heard from school board members who haven't wanted to speak about these, it's the governing document for how they as a group of humans have to behave and have to be elected. So how does it look that they're looking to change? And I do see your point. you know having spent my entire life in education and in you know higher education i think sometimes there's a lack among educational institutes of self reflection and looking back and changing with the needs of a community and so i i do wonder if these periods of forced self reflection aren't beneficial my only comment that tracy would be to go back to where i was a moment ago is that the charter should not have those kinds of things that can and should be changed on a somewhat regular basis. I'll give you a good example. I don't think that the charter, this is my personal view, I don't think we have any business setting the stipend for the school board. Right. Right. <laughs> that shouldn't be a, a matter of the governing constitutional document of the right. district. It effectively should be in the bylaws of the organization as opposed to in the charter. Um, and those kind of things should be, I think, left to the board itself. But other things like how do you elect people to the board, what's the basic structure of how that happens, that should be in the charter. And those should be hard to change. And how to amend the charter. Right. <clears throat> to Tracy's point, <clears throat> you know, having it be confusing and difficult to read is a form of barrier, <laughs> um, but I would say that in truth, anyone who is moving towards, the, and I guess this supports Bill's point a little bit, anyone who's moving towards changing the fundamental governing rules for something as important as a city or a school district, they better have legal support. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, about we should consider TIF issues or something. And the question is, should a rule that specific be baked into our constitutional document, or should it, you know, it's, if you vote against putting it in the charter, you're not voting not that it's not an important issue. You're saying the right place to deal with it is by school board members who are elected from time to time, and they're in the moment rather than, and, and so, you know, I, I agree very much with Bill that charter documents should not be changed that often. Um, <clears throat> that does not mean to say that over the next couple of decades, you know, with the kind of political environment we're seeing, that there won't be a lot of people starting to pay attention how to change constitutions and stuff. And I think there'll be a real battle over exactly what the purpose of this document is versus what the purpose of the elected representatives are. So I, I think, Tracy, I hear your point. I, I, I actually think this is one of the most serious things a citizen could do is initiate this, and it should require them to make sure that they're, and one person might not be able to afford the council, but they're, they, they, they look around and their issue is important they'll find someone who brings the skills to the table to help them cut a path uh, to that. And I, so I, I just think it's a really important document. And, and the legislature of this state has spoken in RSA 49B that they think this is the general way that charter should be, constitutional instruments should be changed. Eric? I, you're absorbing. I'm, right? I'm trying to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I said what I said last week. Uh, oh, thank you. I, I mean, I, so I don't want to rehash all of that. Um, regarding the cost on it that Bill mentioned, 
um, you know, if it's thirty thousand dollars over the course of a decade, it, it's literally nothing. I mean, it's a it's a ninety six million dollar budget times ten. That's a billion dollars over ten years. What's thirty thousand dollars if it's you know? So I don't think that sh you know, all respect, I don't think that's anything to really worry about. But um, again, I said it last week. We're looking at a whole bunch of changes that could have been considered over the last decade that we're being forced to look at that nobody did. Nobody, no, no petitions have come to the school board. Nobody's made any substantive changes. And we're looking at, you know, we've got 11 here that we're, you know, scratching our heads over. So that's kind of what I said last week. I don't want to rehash it, but you made me. Yeah. This um, totally made me. I'm, I'm going to go back again to last time. Uh, last time, there was one core issue, and it was autonomy. And we talked autonomy till we were black in the face. And we only had two questions. And so the two occasions are quite different. We had to get find the most central, primal issue and work it out. And there was a discussion plenty of it and I've alluded to before it ended up being a bargain type thing but the beauty of it is no one is here ten years later to worry about it and and that scared me half to death a couple of years ago if you had asked me do you think the autonomy question is going to come up and I said oh god it's sure to you know we couldn't have had all that hullabaloo last time and have it all dissipate in eight or ten years but basically that happened. So the, the two tasks are quite different. First one, we had to be limited, we had to be focused, we had to be just right. And we were fortunate that this community did see the value of autonomy. But this time, uh, in this uh, cleanup mode that we're in, and, and you pointed out that there are 11 emotions that passed and you know how many of them will survive. Uh, we always have to be concerned about too many because if people start down through a list and it gets too long, they'll just abandon the list. We don't need that. So uh, I, I guess all I'm saying is that um, the, the two occasions are quite different. The conversation we're having now is perfect. And uh, unless someone else wants to add to it, I'd suggest that we leave it for one more time and that one more time will probably culminate in a vote. I can't see that we would have to massage this forever. Uh, we don't want to bore ourselves. The, the only thing I was going, Betty, I was just going to say one thing about it. That I think, you know, we, while we did have a number of motions that have passed, I'm not sure that, and obviously nothing's set in stone yet, but I'm not getting the feeling that there are actually going to be a lot of things that go on, you know, that are actually proposals. <laughs> that are gonna come out of these. We've been doing a lot of discussion, but I think a lot of our discussion has come back to on many of the issues, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Right. So while we are vetting them, I'm not sure we actually are going to propose that many changes uh, at this moment in time. The vetting will go on until the very last possible minute. I mean, uh, to give our uh, creators of the preliminary uh, report their chance. But uh, again, we're, we're, we're struggling with, you know, how long should the vetting go on? And then even after we get the final, all of the items passed that we wish, and, the, and then we may need to narrow those down. There may have to be some priorities made then if we feel like the number that exists and uh, they don't all meet the same criteria or that uh, we've, we feel like it's too many. Well, with your permission then, I will uh, say let's move on and uh, with uh, Betty, can I say something? Of course. Uh, it, just in this, for the sense of urgency, sometimes I think it's best to close an issue. To okay. say, all right, here's an issue we've talked. Yeah. Let's. Well, make it'd be it nice to have one up on the done. So, one o'clock. I propose that we that, that we ch uh, do not put into the charter that we review the charter in ten years. So you're making a motion to vote on it? Yes. Is there a second to that motion? I would second that. Okay. Is there any discussion about the motion? All right. Uh, we don't need a roll call.
No, we should no, take wait. a vote. We don't need a roll call vote. We should take a we vote. Need vote. <laughs> have a voice vote? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, then the question is, uh, on motion 18, uh, whether we would establish a future charter commission uh, date firm. And the uh, question is, are you in favor of uh, establishing a firm date or do you wish not to do that? All those in favor of establishing a future date. Let's, let's clarify. I don't think that's a good so, so let me just try again. I think the motion oh, yeah. that was made is to not put in a provision okay. requiring an automatic mandatory charter in 10 years or in the That's future. That's what you meant, right, Clint? Right. So I second that. <laughs> and then you seconded it. And that now is the question, and I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Those who are in favor will say aye. One, one more time, Betty. I'm sorry. We went to a quintuple negative or something. That like is that. the quintuple. So, the, Clint, <laughs> restate your motion. I can't remember it. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's a, is it, Bill, is it, is All it was is that we don't. or eliminating it from the current charter? No. no, this right. is a different, no. this is different. This is, this is to take the action. I, I think it, 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 we have this other one that we're talking about to eliminate superseded provisions that we've talked about, but I think in this case, it, the motion would be to eliminate the current language, language yeah. that ten requires okay. in 10 years, and that was for this one, and also not to establish any new one. To replace it. To replace it. Okay. That's what I meant, Bill. Would you amend yeah. your motion? Just what you said. And I would second that. <laughs> okay. And, 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 and there is no correction needed. All those in favor of the motion as stated will say aye, aye please. Aye. 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 Are there any objectors? Just me. There's, us. All right. Is there anyone who wishes? How many? And uh, are there any abstain uh, people who will abstain? Thank you. No. Then the, it passes by a. Seven to, Seven to two votes. Betty, Nancy. can I ask a question? Just as this is a ballot type, or a question. So, will this have to appear on the ballot? No. To eliminate the to language eliminate, it will. will need to appear on the ballot. Uh, later, thanks to the work you guys did last week, yeah. I'll have a report on the attorney okay. uh, that, that uh, was discussed and in I think we can follow that up with the attorney okay. to get it right in the preliminary I was just report. curious. I am You're curious, right. too. You're right. It has to, that's why I was crossing my lines, because there we've talked about a motion to eliminate superseded provisions, right? and that would kind of cover that section automatically, but this one is more direct. Uh, about too many. We're not, I, we may be able to cover it with just a single question with, no supersede, but I, the attorney's going to yeah, help gotcha. us get there. Thank you. Okay, we did that. We made sure that got yeah. uh, failed by one of two methods. All right, so um, 19 is not for discussion, and we're working now on motion 20 to recommend further work on changing any of the current provisions related to the requirements for petitions urging charter amendments or revisions. In other words, the charter petition requirements question. Is that stated so that everybody knows what we're trying to talk about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Does anybody know if what is in the charter itself of several pages is boilerplate from somewhere else? Yes. If I could, um, so I want, we just chatted about this. The source for what's in the charter now mm -hmm. is RSA Chapter 49B, which is, that's what it was based on. There are a few things where we change certain things. For example, RSA 49B doesn't require uh, a statement of what vote you need to approve an amendment. Our charter commission 10 years ago set that at a 60% supermajority vote. The, the, I will say this, just to kind of modify on this particular point my statement earlier, the source for the current language what is RSA 49B, but there have been a few amendments since 10 years ago to RSA 49B, and one of the things I talked to the lawyer about that we're going to need Tracy's made good arguments about, but 
you know, we may still say track the statute is good, it'll avoid trouble with the various state officials who are reviewing it, but we should track the current statute potentially. The City of Concord School Board is not required to track the current statute. There is ability to argue for changes here and there, but the general impression is you should try to follow the statute. There's bunches of municipalities in New Hampshire who have charters that were based on the exact same language that we based ours on, and they're not changing theirs. But I think this is something that is a kind of like technical legal question, and you know, I'd like to have some presentation, and I think the right thing to do is have it done by the attorney, uh, oh, okay. for, which is like, what would the changes look like if we were to update to the current statute after those amendments? I'm no expert in that, mm -hmm. um, but I did check and saw some amendments. So Bill, I, I um, when the charter was returned to Concord, it was returned with some references to 49B, correct? So we're, your point is we're not obligated to follow the 49B procedure for amending the charter. We're, no, what we did, we're, we're, we're obligated to follow what's in our charter that has been approved by the voters. Right. Not the statute. Okay. But so. we were advised the last time that the best thing you can do to avoid trouble with the review that comes from our, pro when we get to our preliminary report with our few, few items, it's going to go to the DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration State, the AG's office, and it's going to go to the Secretary of State. And what we heard last time was they typically want the local charter to be consistent with that. And you can statute. see why, right? Because you know? they want to have some uniformity right. across right. the state. Right. And no, you know, quick changes where you've got bond issuances and the like for the DRA. And what we would like to have happen is for Tracy Lesser to run for state senate <laughs> and to win. And then get decent language in and then that convince statute. 16 so other that's people. not <laughs> lawyer-like, but then we pat, well, then we piggyback that. Yeah. Do you mean chemistry language? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's precise. I am a, it's no. precise. <laughs> am I hearing uh, that we sort of zip by this until we that's can have a yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, independent legal friend. person yeah. here mm -hmm. present and uh, advise us? Well. So it was ordered, so it'll be done. Uh, then we're back to page one again. And uh, we keep calling on the same people who have been so kind to uh, do the work for us on the treasurer and cl uh, clerk business. Um, is one of you ready to just give us a, a quick option? I have an update. Okay, good. Which is, um, uh, pursuant to discussion that uh, Bill Glan and I had, I reached out, uh, I was on a call with someone from the Attorney General's office, uh, uh, and, and I took the liberty of saying, oh, can we change the topic? Um, you know, I, in my capacity as a member of this commission, after we had discussed, we would like to come see the right person at the Attorney General's office and raise these two questions. And uh, the person said she would, uh, that I should just send the issue in writing, which I've almost finished. <coughs> I'm going to do that. And then the goal would be to have that meeting that we had discussed with Kate and, and me and Bill being a representative and, and report back to you. So the update, the contact has been made, uh, which is good. And the, the person was receptive to, have, to making sure that we had the proper meeting. Thank you very much for the update. Thank Encouraging you. news. Can Progress I, made. Can I ask a question about that? Of course, Tom. So way early on in one of our meetings, and I made a couple of notes, and I've since mislaid them, we had some dis dis quick discussion about RSA, and I think it was maybe 671? Yes, sir. You got okay. it. Okay. And in that, there was, it was tied to the discussion we're having right now, I believe. Yes. And if something was agreed upon, 
by the Attorney General's office, then we wouldn't have to do something else. Now, that's very kind of nebulous right there, I agree, but can you refresh my memory on? Yes, please. I would love, I'd love to. Uh, this is kind of an issue near and dear to my heart. The last 10 years ago, it was clearly the goal of everyone around the table and the school board at the time <coughs> that they would continue the historic method, which was that the, the school board, which was elected, <coughs> would appoint the clerk, who was, we saw Mr. Phillips, and now it's uh, uh, Pat Taylor, and the treasurer. Mm -hmm. And they, we had kind of a professional uh, situation with the treasurer. When we eliminated charter, the, the attorney general informed us that probably the secretary of state said, there's this conflict in the statute. Well, at that time, and you can tell, I'm not the quietest person in the world. I'm a little bit noisy. And I went, that's crazy. The, and Bill's suffered and Kate has suffered through my positions on this. So my thought is, Tom, that if we, if we go back to the Attorney General's office now, which is a different group, before we get squeezed by time and we go do all the work in the preliminary mm -hmm. report, we just ask them, how are you interpreting the statute? Could we ask you to take a look at it? Because we're all nine people working on this, and we don't want to send you a preliminary report that you have to object to. Tell us, and we'll follow that. And so the goal is to try and take a shot and see if we can't have them say, yeah, we actually agree with you, 671-6, you lawyer, you, does not apply to the Concord School District. And if we get that and report it to you, the discussion is now not wasted. Um, that we can talk about appointment or not, and whether this group feels a change would be warranted. And we could quickly go to conclusion on that. Does that help, Tom? It's perfect. That's exactly what I was trying to remember, right. and uh, I, and I, I wanted us all to be able to prevent any use of our time. Yes. Yeah. Talking about something that eventually may <laughs> be changed beyond avoid. that power. It doesn't right. matter. I mean, it, it, I just make the point that. We can convince the attorney general's office all we want. They have to convince the, the secretary of state. And <laughs> the secretary of state generally looks to advice from the attorney general's office. Having been in that office, I can tell you they don't always follow it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, but Bill's point is exactly right. Rather than spending all the time and effort to figure out what we want and then find out that we're, we're going to run into a roadblock if we do it let's try to get let's try to as my mother would say would have said let's try to get flies with honey rather than vinegar yes exactly. and again I express the uh, thanks of the whole Commission for the three of you being so diligent in this and, and in other affairs well with that said I'm back on page one and we just talked about motions one and two and then numbers motions three through nine uh, we're in the other pile, and so uh, up tonight for discussion for probably the second time, uh, the combined motions 10, 11, and 12, and we have new information today. And so, Tracy, uh, you're the author of this, and I'm so glad that you, you know, I extended the invitation to bring us stuff, and, now, and you are, and so... Uh, do you want to give us just an idea so that we're all on the same page, literally, as far as the terms and the, and the goals? So, all yours. Okay, so, um, I... Could you pull the microphone a little closer oh, to you? Oh, sorry. Yep. Thank you. So, I went through and did a deep dive into sort of published literature rather than relying on people's sort of thoughts and opinions on it on, you know, two, two real questions here. How do we try and reflect the diversity within the school? And one of the things I wanted to point out, and that's where my table is, and I want to thank Lyndon for helping me pull together some of this information. Um, the city of Concord demographic data does not necessarily match these students present in the district. The students tend to be more diverse than the Concord population at large and poor. And so I, th I think that's something 
that I mean it's important to note that Concord matches that natural trend. I mean we've got within our school um, about a 28 percent poverty line compared to the town at whole which is about nine percent and do you and can you explain why that happens so it seems to be that um, retirees oh okay so we have people from an entirely different age group yeah so you yeah. have uh, the city of Concord has a lot of reasonably well-off retirees living in there skewing the demographics wealthier than the, the, the school than the families okay. with school age children no 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 it's a, you know when you see little uh, on discrepancy, so to speak. It's nice to have an explanation why. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, the kind of the question that I wanted to ask is how do we get a school board that reflects it? And, and then I answer the question, why do we care? Why should our school board match the population in the school? And I think I pulled, there was a lot of literature answering that question. I pulled what I thought were the two and I, I just, I literally copy pasted from those articles. Um, and it just goes to show achievement gaps and um, punishment and things like that decline when the school board diversity matches the actual student population. And this is really well peer reviewed, large sample size data. Um, and then, you know, we, we had some conversations about who participates in school board elections. So I wanted to show another study that just, you know, who's. Um, the people voting typically in school board elections don't have kids in the school. So again, we have people voting in school board elections that don't match the population of the school. And there's nothing we can do to control that. But it's something I think we just need to be aware of as we're having these conversations um, going forward that the voters in general are wealthier than our student population and, and maybe coming from a different perspective. So the one thing that was clear through a lot of this data that the school board member the more likely you are to have a diversity that matches your school district that in at large mm -hmm. school boards tend to be upper class white and the more you pull from neighborhoods the more you can match it then the second question that was brought up is that question about special interest groups how do we and so this was an interesting one because when you dig through the literature, there's years and years of data about one special interest group taking over school board elections, and that was teachers unions. And there's a lot of data on that, but that's not really who has become a concern in recent years. And in recent years, it's been looking at the single issue interest group, those who want to take over a school board because of a decision a school made on masks or vaccines or curriculum or book banning or things of that nature and looked at them the sample size is disturbingly low and and I would say that you know basically there was a study that was done in Bridgeport Connecticut Colorado Los Angeles and I'm drawing a blank on the fourth city and half of the districts that had takeovers were at large and half were ward based and and there's really no conclusions that can be taken from that, though I did find some anecdotal mentions in a couple of the articles that said that the best way that they were guessing to combat this was campaign finance, making sure that people are reporting where the money's coming from so you can look to see if special interest groups are taking it over. And I did find it interesting that Colorado has a bill before the legislature on two different levels, two different bills, to cap school board donations at $2,500 to $300,000 per candidate. Of course, we don't have any of that. In fact, that's one of the issues that we're looking at now. Well, we want to make sure that doesn't, I mean, that we don't get what happened in Chicago, in Colorado. Exactly, because a well-organized, well-funded, uh, uh, significant interest group, uh, whether they're book banners or uh, free staters are worried about mass, they all have the idea that they want control of, of the school board. Uh, so thank you. Go on, please. So that was all I really wanted to say is, you know, sort of my conclusion is that the current ward zone district based system, though I would argue that um, going even smaller in the long run would be better and that was one of my reasons for voting down the other provision because as the pop you know I, i'm concerned as, as a population of concord changes 
that we want to in increase diversity and sometimes that's make smaller voting pools than what we have. And last week I had also handed out um, numbers and there is a small discrepancy in that Ward District A has just under 2,000 less, fewer voters than Districts B and C do. Um, I know now that being said, redistricting is going on and there seems to be some growth in parts of um, Ward 4 and some other areas of town that could affect the District A numbers trending upward. But those aren't finalized by the city yet, the redistricting. Okay. Uh, can you tell me how many people uh, of uh, mm, uh, who we would classify as ones who represent diversity have been successful candidates during uh, the 10-year uh, period that we've tried out uh, so what I don't, district more do I don't know that there's been a, a, a candidate that hasn't looked like everyone in this room. Um, that being said, in a lot of this literature, it suggests that often to get um, d more diverse school boards, it does take some recruiting and some effort to bring forward candidates. You know, the, you know, and we could also argue that, um, you know, when we talk about the cost of being on the school board with child care, that mm -hmm. does, you know, okay. you know, things like that. It's hard to volunteer for something unless you're wealthy. Yeah, we, we've touched on that yeah. a, a little bit, the whole idea of stipend and whose responsibility it is to set it and how to do it and that sort of thing. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, financial records to look at for the Concord School Board. I'm not sure how much help that would be, but at least it would be another question answered. Bill. I just have a question for you, Tracy. Yep. You're, um, you noted that most of the people who vote in school board elections don't have children in the schools. Is that, a, is that a comment about Concord or a comment more generally? That's a national trend. This was a study over 10,000 school boards and voting done nationwide and um, looking at voter rolls of who voted ver and um, surveys of who voted versus who's in the schools. And Well, some of that just may, may mirror the trend that people, that the people who generally vote or the people who vote the most, the highest percentage, are older, right? right? It's true in the United States generally. I think it follows, yeah. That. And I think that's even more so in local elections, municipal type mm -hmm. elections, as opposed mm -hmm. to, you know, the, you get more younger voters in national elections than municipal. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yes, please. Did you have a chance, and you've done great, great work here, to look at <clears throat> what the distribution is across you know, either some area of the country between districts, city council type things or school boards that based on size, I mean, you mentioned, you know, like Bridgeport and, you know, Milwaukee, um, in terms of the balance between at large and, you know, some district level voting setup. So I tried to find more. I, that was one of the things that I was looking for. Is there a place that I can compi could compile data Multisize. based on, yeah. like, so like Los Angeles is ward-based voting, yeah. um, and there are other places. What are more? We would be considered, I think, under a number of metrics to technically be rural. Yeah. Um, and so you know, rural was in a slightly different category with actually fewer engagement, much less engagement, much less diversity. Um, tended to be more zone district than larger municipalities from Glance. It tended to be more at large district than. No, more zoned. More, rural. more district based. Like yeah. The smaller, ones. the smaller ones. The smaller ones tended to be. Than the large cities. That's yeah. Hmm. Uh, but it seems, yeah. And so I can, and that was something I could not find an actual piece of data. It was little glimpses from articles. Are we assuming there is a lack of a concern for di diversity within the Concord School District? What do you uh, assuming there is none or a lack of it? Um, activities, operations, remediations, rehabilitations. Are we assuming that that is not occurring in the Concord School District now, and therefore we're trying to fix it? 
I guess I'm not understanding what you're asking. Okay, well, I guess I'll ask the question a different way. Um, I wonder how many people here realize that the Concord School District has three new assistant principals, all of whom come from diverse backgrounds. And I applauded that and even spoke to one of them and said how, how pleased I was. Um, I do think there is an effort uh, uh, a foot within the Concord School District already. So then we ask the question, what sort of strides have been made and by how did they originate? So I would consider the idea of having three uh, top level administrators uh, among the five elementary schools a real strong step in the right direction because that has to have an influence on relationships within the school. And then there are I, I was dismayed back at the time that uh, we talked about full day kindergarten because there were people in here saying things that you know, uh, there was no extra help, no uh, concern, no uh, programs designed specifically for people with special needs. Whether the special needs were a wheelchair bound child, a child with a, an eye problem, uh, a child who came from a uh, a country that uh, you would call him either an evacuee or an, a refugee or an uh, immigration person. And there are lots of things that are going on in the Concord School District. I'm sure that if we brought uh, Kathleen Murphy in, she would be happily happy to tell us exactly what's going on. And then I think uh, one of the most interesting things is there is a committee established now, a broad group of folks who are interested in uh, examining policy, especially policy around suspensions and uh, uh, children who are made to take a few days off from school because of their behavior. And I, I think that it's probably fair to say that <clears throat> this move to change the policies and to also change the execution of the policies came from a new Concord School Board member, a young man uh, who definitely is white and comes from a very professional family. So there are lots of ways, in my opinion, for us to look at the, the whole idea of diversity and accommodating children from um, diverse backgrounds and languages and ethnicities and races uh, so that the, the presence of a school board member, I, I just question um, what would he or she do that would change it. I, I, I just don't get the connection between the presence of one school board member in a group of nine or 10 or 11 to children of diverse backgrounds. Did you run into any reason why that might hook so up? So I, I only excerpt, excerpt part of this. Um, art, so I linked to two articles here. The first one is Hughes et al. and the second is Kogan et al. Um, and I can get you actual copies of these oh, if that's you'd okay. like them. No. no, I've read your materials four times. <laughs> um, and, and so I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in this. I, I, you know, I pulled yeah, no, these no, and I read them. I, I'm certainly a well, geochemist. Well, none of us are. Um, but I think the literature is very clear in a number of studies that just having that one school board member of diversity, it, it does, you know, you look at the data of number of suspensions, number of days out of school relationships, it makes a difference. Why it is, I'm not going to pretend to understand, but the data seems to That's show that it That's what I'm struggling does. with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What, well, what's the Betty, connection? I, I think, Go ahead. I, I think you're, what you're talking about is there are a lot of good intentions, but I think there's still a ton of work to be done by the Concord School right. District. Yeah. Uh, to say that we are you know, leading the way is, is I'm, I think, a little bit premature, in my opinion. And I'm speaking on my opinion now here, you know. Yeah, some, but at least you, you're familiar with the schools. I am, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And someone who, frankly, ran, for, you know, I, I do think there are a lot of good intentions. I think there are people who are making efforts, but I think there's still a long way to go. And I think just as you acknowledge that, the hiring of some of the leaders in some of our schools is very important for students because representation matters. I think representation on the school board matters as well, just exactly for the same reasons you said. It, you know, I, I do think that there are differences in position in perspectives that improve. You know, I, I think businesses across the United States are having these discussions right now about diversity in perspective, experience, all of those things nets better results in the end. And I think it's, 
you know, I, I don't know why it would not be true for a school board as well to have differing opinions, differing experiences, all of those things, you know, would ultimately lead to better results for more kids. I guess I was just hoping that because we had had <coughs> that, uh, we had had uh, ward district voting in, uh, well, actually eight years since it started, uh, that we haven't had a, uh, a candidate, not even a candidate that I know of, and certainly not a winner, uh, a, school, a successful school board person uh, through the opportunity of the smaller, and, and there's much to be said from the smaller union, um, from the smaller setting that may uh, encourage or give incentive to people who uh, might have particular difficulty in, in running for school board. I, I'm just trying to get the connections that's all built. That's it. Did you have a oh, Female representation in what historically have been male-dominated boards and professions, and it, to me, it's the same thing. Representation matters. Perspectives matters. Matter. Lived experience matters. And so, I think it's. I understand there may not be data, <laughs> but I think all of us can speak to the value of diverse experiences and lived experiences on groups that you're a part of. Um, and to speak to the idea that in eight years there hasn't been a so-called diverse uh, candidate, I think this is a long haul. This is a long process of recruitment, of fertilizing you know, the territory, of giving a sense of welcoming and um, confidence to, to potential candidates out there that I think really all of us in the community need to be paying attention to. Bill. So um, I think your comment, Betty, mixed apples and oranges a little bit in the sense that whatever the school board is doing in terms of its focus on diversity or its focus on problems in the city that or issues, I won't say problems, just issues in the city that may result from a far more diverse city than Concord was when I moved here 45 years ago. That's a different issue from what the board looks like. And I think that the one thing we could probably all agree on is that the school board ought to represent the city. And by that I mean some older people who may be concerned about their taxes, although I, I don't think in general you've seen people running for the school board to cut programs. women, um, perhaps a balance of people from different professions. Um, and I suppose one advantage, well, th there's lots of, Bill sent me some stuff today, and there's a lot of literature out there that deals with, for example, if you've got a city where you have certain wards in the city that are economically disadvantaged or that have particular racial content, it's very unlikely that at-large elections are going to end up with a representation in the city that mm -hmm. that mirrors the population of the city. It, just for the same reason that we're in all these debates nationally about how you redistrict and don't redistrict, et cetera. Yes, um, and I think we've got, I, I don't know the answer to this, but I suspect that the current configurations of wards um, does include in each of those wards, a pretty good spectrum of economics because this is a city that reflects that, right? We've got wealthy, one of the things I think I can say I like about living in Concord, it's just not homogenous like a lot of suburbs. It does have a spectrum across the range of economic conditions, of um, certainly a more diverse population. So. I think all I'm saying is, I don't know what the right answer is. I don't know whether it's ward voting or whether it's at-large voting. I could make the argument the other way around that, um, for example, some of the statistics show that women have a much better chance of getting elected if there are if there are district or citywide elections rather than ward elections. But um, I do think the comments are right that. Whatever voting system we have, it should be a voting system that gets good candidates 
who are able to run in that system. And secondly, ideally, you end up with a school board that mirrors the the needs of the school system and the city as a whole. Bill. <clears throat> I think, uh, I wanna, the Bill's mentioned that I've done this. I wanna number one, again, apologize to all of you for missing your beginning discussion on this. And I'm very interested in this issue. I think it's really important. I think it's hard. And I wanted to go through a couple of thoughts to get on the table with you guys. It's, this is hard because there's several goals that we're talking about that are bundled together. Diversity, the data you're looking at, as I looked at it, was really focused on, uh, at, at the first instance, a kind of racial diversity. But then some of the other work you found, we, we care about residence diversity, right? That people forget about, they could all be uh, the exact same appearance, but there's some benefit potentially to having diversity of residents. There's also gender diversity, which you mentioned, Bill. That's another thing that gets impacted by the method of electing. And then Tracy's got really good economic diversity, which is a challenge because it's not just the voting configurations. There are other concerns. Another kind of spectrum that tortures me on this issue is the question of having it be easier to run and win on the one hand, but a fear that if you have a system that's really easy to run and win in, you could attract attention by one special interest group or another to manipulate that system to get and, and stack you know, the elections and put a rush on. We all know in our environment we're in, that's a greater risk today than it was 10 years ago. I, I you know, as I said early on in this issue, I am uh, okay with the concept of having a mixed system at large with some districts, you know, which districts are wards, let's call them wards. I'm okay with that. For me, the only question is whether the current mix, which is six ward dis districts members and three at-large members, is the right mix or not. And because of the staggered term we have, which is three, 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 for three years apiece, there is only really practically two options. It is the current system for me or it is one that shifts from the current six ward, three at large split to three ward and six at large. So to me, the real question is down to what, to state our goals clearly. What is our goal? What, and then to study a little bit, and uh, I, I have st something, to add to the mix, but I, I did, I'm gonna send it to everyone the way Tracy did, and I'm gonna send it to Tracy first, so she can, a, a Princeton professor and a Portland State University professor in 2008, did a really soup to nuts piece, which did kind of, the story of this <laughs> issue is really interesting, historically. In the 20s and 30s, guess who advocated for at-large uh, voting districts and municipal elections? Progressives. The New Deal-y type progressive. Why? They valued this kind of image of expertise in uh, government and having people who are expert in the task to win. That was their goal. By the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, that had flipped because the challenge in the larger cities of these at-large districts was they were being used. So if you had you know, a minority population that's 30%, and you had a majority population that's the balance, 70, and electing nine members at large, where every voter in the district gets nine votes, ends up getting you 100%, if everyone's gonna vote on, on the majority, major, majority characterization, that's not consistent with the goal that Bill Glahn laid out.
So what the, the, the remedy that they used, and, and in this case argued for, the NAACP has done this in cases as recent as 2021 that they won uh, in New York State, has said we have to structure uh, ward voting to eliminate this. And, and what's interesting is if you, <laughs> what Bill said, if you structure ward voting, if you draw the districts wrong, you get the exact same result in math. So it's really hard to get, and you're in that goal, let's assume, with, with is racial diversity as, as one goal. You've got to be really careful. Imagine in the city of Concord, which has got a substantial majority uh, registered Democrats, if you went and tried to draw the districts in a way that would have 30% Republicans having, getting, getting elected, and right now it's 100%, right, uh, Democrats, because of the way we've drawn our wards. Another problem with me this, that, that I'm struggling with is city council, they have wards, but their representation is when you're elected from ward one, your duty is to represent that ward at the city council table. In this case, that's not right. You don't <coughs> represent District A at this table. Uh, I, I see in the materials that Lyndon and Betty had prepared, the principals say clearly, and we had a great legis uh, member, current member, I'm bad with names, but she said very articulately, I represent the whole of the city. There's a confusion in that to me that bothers me, which is a voter in Ward 1 voting for a District A candidate, do they think that person is going to argue for resources for Beaver Meadow School or whatever over others? And it really gets confusing when you get to Runlet, which is the top issue we're going <laughs> to face in the next 10 years, and the high school. There's the districts, the ward approach doesn't make any sense there. So with all of these swirling around my head, I'm trying to, to get data. I did look at the data from that Betty had and up through current on residence diversity. What I think we've heard in testimony so far is not really the excellent points about economic diversity or racial diversity. I think it's been about residence diversity. And I've seen comments come in, including one I received, that, that that's important. It didn't have that impact. I did a statistical analysis of residents by ward before the new ward system was adopted 10 years ago. We had people elected in the at-large system spread all over the city. That's the data. There may be perception differences, but that's the data. That's the myth. And after, it's the same thing. In other words, even with the kind of forced residency aspect of the district, it hasn't materially changed the outcome. So you say, OK, if we got to really think about this issue from what Tracy has brought to the table. Because you know, I, for one, am absolutely committed to the premise that having gender diversity on a board, whether it's in a private sector entity or a public sector entity, having racial diversity, having bill standard, having the representative body reflect the demographics and structure of your city, that matters. If you ask me right now, and I'm a nutcase math person, well, Bill, how would you achieve that? There's not enough data to do it. I read this case. It would, I'll send it around. The horrific facts of what happened in a community in New York to stack the board membership with people who wanted to cut the budget in this uh, uh, district. It was stunning. Mm -hmm. I looked at every piece of proof that was introduced by great trial lawyers. We can't construct the same proof. 
And so where I end up coming down is, um, is I don't know the answer. If, if it were for me, the confusion part matters to me. So while I am eminently persuadable by each of you, right now I'm leaning towards putting a question on the ballot that would say shift to six at large in three districts, but boy, I would check the data about population. Because one thing, which is a gigantic mistake, <coughs> is if we're electing, if you're voting for someone from a district with 6,000 people, population, and another district just by virtue of population change is at 8,000, that's wrong because votes are diluted. And so redistricting is supposed to help, but not if there's cross movement at three or four wards into a single district. And so we really have to be careful about it. Um, I think our focus should be to really ask the question, who has clever ideas about how we could structure the mix to get this? Uh, last thing I would say is in this thing, Bill referenced it, uh, this one article from 2008, and, and Tracy has more recent, but this is the most complete article I saw. It's called The Context Matters, the Effects of Single Member Versus At-Large Districts on City Council Diversity. That's another difference. But it's got a great reference set. Um, you know, it came to the conclusion that if what you want to do is elect women, so focus on gender diversity for the moment, you want at-large districts. Two people had suggested. Whereas, it was kind of unclear on racial diversity. It, it had a great effect in larger communities, but no effect or a negative effect in smaller communities. Do you know what our current gender, I was just going to try and look it up on my phone, what's the current gender diversity on the school board right now? Four that's males, five females. Right. So I don't think that's an issue our district has. And yeah. I, as long as I've been here, it's been more women. Or fi just fairly. It's been, it. yeah. I, 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 I would argue that the bigger concern right now in the Concord School District is, is racial and socioeconomic equality among representation mm -hmm. and gender is to me, not as big of an issue at this point. Go ahead, Bill. I appreciate you guys letting me catch up to you, by the way. Thank okay. you. I, um, Bill Glenn. I listened to the discussion, and I think there is simply no way we can do it. That we can identify a specific, that we could decide that ward voting versus at large voting is going to change the composition of people who serve on the school board. We just don't have enough information except for one possible thing. And that is running from a group of wards arguably makes it easier to get elected to the school board. Um, now, back in the 80s when I was running for the school board and serving on the school board then, the way you got elected was, was you ran a couple of times, right? And then you got your name out there, and people in the city knew who you were. And you primarily campaigned in the area that you lived in because those are people likely, you know, you want to run up, if you want to get elected to the school board at large, you run up votes in the area where you live. Or alternatively, if, if all, if, you're, if it's an all at large election, you try to encourage people to just vote for you and not three other candidates. Um, I just, I mean, I, I, I'll go back to where I started. I think you want the school board to represent the city, but there's so many issues like, if the issue is to get people who are more diverse, you also, I mean, the practical fact of the matter is, people aren't running for the school board, period. There's not, I mean, in, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, there would always be five or six candidates running for each seat. That's not happening. And it may be not happening for a number of reasons. Um, that's not to say I would not encourage it, but I would simply say the only thing that I can think of 
that favors ward voting is that it makes it easier to get elected. And, and that may be a factor that then would allow people who are younger and don't, haven't made a name within the city, people who have a more diverse background who can get, who, who would attract um, the votes of people who think they would represent their interests on the school board. Um, by that I mean that, I, that came out the wrong way. We don't want people who are diverse who run for the school board to represent the interests of a particular group of people. We want more <coughs> diverse representation on the school board because it, it is a, it's more reflective of our community. Um, so how do you ensure that? Well, that, my point is, I don't know. And I don't, I don't think we have enough information in this city to say that if we went to a, it, let's just take a hypothetical. Every ward gets, a, gets someone on the school board. I, there may be too many wards for that. But um, everybody gets their representative from their ward. Um, to me, that's inconsistent with a different, um, different consideration. Well, this, I'd, I'd like to weigh in on, on the well, obvious. Let me just finish, yeah, this is ahead. a multi-million-dollar budget that this mm -hmm. school board now operates. You've got to have people. You've got to have the best people that you can get to serve on the board who are willing to put in the time and effort if they don't have the background and expertise to be able to deal with that. And those people don't reside equally in each ward within the city. Now, could you find someone from each ward of the city who might be able to do that? Sure, but they have to be, they, they, wanna, they wanna run. So I guess where I end up on this is, I don't know what the right method is. I know that an at-large allows everybody to have the same chance. On the other hand, I recognize that it's hard to do it that way and so I'm, I may by default come out in Bill's position, which is either 6336. Three, three, I don't know what the right answer is. I, I just, um, I, I, and I don't think we're going to have enough data to be able to decide what the right answer is. Uh, uh, Clint, go ahead. Uh, I, <clears throat> I agree with both you guys. We're not, if we are looking for diversity on the school board um, in different ways, um, at large, award voting I'm not sure we've had 10 years we've got 50 years before that uh, what we do is we get wealthy or that kind of person mostly running for the school board uh, it's an issue that's different than the wars but was brought up and then Bill said you know setting the the income I mean a pay for school board members isn't an issue we should handle uh, maybe that's so, but right now, no one can handle it on the school board because we've restricted it to what the school, the city council gets. And I think if I had to change one thing about the school board to get people who may be younger, single with children, something like that, to run for the board, is to make it at least so that they could cover their child care costs. And I don't know how we do that, but I think, in my mind, that's a huge thing. And uh, on as far as ward vote voting, whatever everybody really likes, I'm going that way. Because, <laughs> you know, there's-, there's Mr. Congeniality. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Nancy. I guess I go back to, uh, I, I, all of this data has been, it's very enlightening. It's not terribly conclusive, but it's very enlightening and interesting. But I go back to, in all the input we've gotten, there has been one email from one constituent who suggested we go to all at large. Every other, <coughs> now we haven't been inundated, but every other either speaker or email has said, leave it the way it is. The school board has, and the community have had 10 years to put forward um, petition or <laughs> um, the board could have put forth an amendment. Neither one of those things happened. I guess so, so my feeling is in the absence of good, hard, applicable data, 
to our kind of community. Inclination is we leave things the way they the way it is because it's not broken. I we we need to continue to work to get people to run. Um, diversity or not, we need to encourage people to run. The best people, but also representing the community. I just I've heard nothing and read nothing that makes me feel like there's a compelling reason to change the way we've structured things. So. Well, go I ahead. say, based on what we, what I read in the literature, and I think my point was, the system we have in place is one of the most advantageous mm -hmm. at this time if we wanted to attract diversity. There's no guarantee in any of the systems you will get diversity, right. but right. you want to make it as easy as possible to bring people on right. with with di with different backgrounds and perspectives, and you don't want to be exclusionary. Right. And I, I think the system we have is the better choice. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, Bill, I, I was going to try and come up with the kindest way to throw it back at you, but sort of the argument you were making about a charter is a charter, we shouldn't willy-nilly amend it, all those things, you know, the six or three, three or six, to me, again, we haven't had the groundswell of people coming in saying this isn't working, we should change it, in my opinion, that says it all, and we should just keep it. It's, com it's compelling to me these positions. In addition, I think we dealt with the stipend issue while I was gone, you did, and I saw that debate and I have thoughts on that, but they follow what Clint said directly. I'm not saying set the number. My position wouldn't be set the number in charter, but give the school board the same power the city council has yes. to set the number that they think is right based on circumstances, but it only takes effect they get some check with that. But I think if it, it may be that I think it's compelling, the argument you're making, and to try and achieve the, the goals of kind of diversifying the participation on the school board, it, it maybe I, I, let the school board get the signal that that is a goal from right. the voters and have them try to work policies like stipend setting that will help generate through the system that kind of support. I, you guys, that's a great argument, Nancy, same thing. Eric. Just a couple of things. Um, with regard to the I, Clint's idea, whatever, uh, what you just said about the school, the school board setting it, a devil's advocate here is you're only talking about three seats. Six of them are carryovers on the next election. So let's pretend the six say, you know what, we want 100,000 bucks a year. <laughs> they won't be you know, you're within you're long. within the limits of the next election, but only three of them are affected. Right. So you, you can put it off for ten years, but that's not going to solve the problem immediately. Yeah. And that's just I'm saying ten years to be silly. You're emphatic about it, but you know. But you can make an effective uh, the number six so is each, important. But how each one gets the raise after their turn <coughs> over. Yeah. Each set. Right. Yeah. You could require a seven vote margin. <laughs> Yes. A what? For um, any increase in school board salary. I mean, we're kind of getting into that issue, which we, sorry, maybe we are not to the moment, but, but Eric, Eric, I interrupted you. No, no, no. And the other thing I was, you know, just going back to the diversity thing and the concern, one of the concerns Tracy brought up was in terms of um, single issue people. As much as I am. I'm trying to be as PC as it, whatever, but not in favor of those types of persons, okay? I would rather take a chance on having somebody like that on the board and keep the bar low enough. The, the same bar for the single uh, interest person, single issue person, is the bar for the single mother with three jobs. So I would rather take the chance on getting that single mother with three jobs on the board than worrying about the maybe of somebody that might not be great for the district. Thank you. Um, 
Tom. this afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry, Tom. For these numbers, these are some good work here. One of the things that strikes me in this chart in the bottom is that we're dealing, we're talking about trying to fix something that maybe can't be fixed right this minute. And, and sometimes I get onto these committees and others, and I say, I really want to fix this. But really what I need to do is take a step back and say, maybe I can't fix it, but I can open the door for it to be fixed. And so maybe one of the things we can do to open that door is to really consider, you know, what is the best way, as we are sitting here right now doing, what is the best way that we can open the door for um, folks who are non-white to be able to come in, or moms or dads who are single and, and, and struggling or not, and I think that that answer lies in somewhere in here in the discussions of three from another. The other thing that occurs to me is, it, is that I've lived in Concord for a lot of years, and our population of non-white people is very new. I mean, in, in the history of Mankind, it's, it's new in Concord, and so maybe in time, it's going to self-fix. You know, and, and maybe one of the ways that that happens is that you have an individual from a, from a district who, as Jim Richards said, and, and I've practiced and others have, you go in into your district and you knock on doors and you meet people, and then those folks like you, want you, believe in you, and vote for you. And that becomes the way that we get perhaps our first non-white person. Takeaways here is we've got a very small population of folks. We're talking about four per, uh, excuse me, 3.3 percent um, of black or African Americans. And others, uh, all of those other numbers are very small. And the other is that uh, it's, a, it's a young population. It's going to take some time for someone to feel comfortable enough to come forward and say, hey, I can do this. And I think that it will. Well, I'm So just, I think our, our, yeah. our job is to open the door any way we can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I sat this afternoon after reading Tracy's material extensively, and I came up with something that just made me so discouraged. But I'm going to read it to you anyway because I, I, I hope I'm wrong. But I, I believe that we cannot control who runs for school board. We can make it more user friendly, but we cannot control it. We cannot control how they campaign. We cannot control whether or not they win. We cannot control how long they stay and we cannot control what they may or may not accomplish. Mm -hmm. So if you think that we're at a, uh, a place where we're ready to commit Harry Carey because we don't have good information in order to make the decision, guess what? Even after we make the decision, there are all these things that we can't control. I mean, so yeah, on the one hand, you feel powerful, and on the other hand, you feel totally uninformed. And, uh, how, how, you, how we wrestle this out. I think it's pretty clear. There's no one here who's gonna say nine at large and no one who's gonna say nine ward district. The only question is three six or six three, uh, six, three the other way around. So um, um, maybe we can't go wrong. Maybe we can't control it. Uh, maybe we have to look at that when we get all of our things together and say, okay, maybe the issue about stipend is a bigger issue than some others. And, and people may change their minds. So there's still going to be vetting, as I say, right up until the last minute. Mm -hmm. But I can't thank you enough for such an honest and um, well-intentioned and helpful, uh, I've learned a lot tonight. Uh, some of the concerns I have have been minimized. Other concerns I have have been maximized, but I think we're all in the same place. We're struggling. and. Uh, I don't hear anybody calling for a vote tonight. Well, I was actually just going to say, in the interest of what Clint said earlier and moving forward, I would like to actually make a motion to... You would like to make a motion. Go yes, ahead. for a vote to, for on number 12, to continue the current mix of at-large and ward candidates.
facts as they are. All right. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Motion has been made and seconded that the situation, which now calls for two consecutive uh, at-large, uh, uh, excuse me, ward district voting followed by one at-large district uh, voting, uh, will be the format and therefore no change. Have I said that properly? Yeah. I don't know if a change in the charter is this. No no is the further discussion? Tom. The discussion, so go ahead, sorry. So, <laughs> two hours ago I would have gone with this without any problem, but folks have opened my eyes even wider. and um, So I'm gonna probably vote no in hopes that maybe it'll come back again, or maybe it won't. I mean, it. I'm not sure. I, you know, Bill made a good point um, that how do we really know? Can we get more data to figure out if there's a right way or a wrong way? Maybe there isn't any out there, and maybe it's time to just hang it up and say, you know what? It's been working, so let's do it. Right. I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of. Between a rock and a hard place right here, right yeah, now. Yeah, we, we are. Bill. So um, this reminds me of the great comment by the trial lawyer when the judge said to him, I've been listening you, to you for hours and I'm none the wiser. <laughs> he said, well, Your Honor, none the wiser but better informed. And um, that's kind of the way I feel, which is I've gotten more information, but I have no idea what the right resolution to it would be. So all I so the where, where I come out on it is, and it isn't just that people haven't petitioned or they haven't you know made major. We're not seeing a lot of letters to the editor. We're not hearing a lot of background noise in Concord that this Nothing. is wrong. Um, we I have heard anecdotal information that people don't necessarily feel that this has result that the current configuration has resulted in the best candidates running for the board, but. That's everybody's view of what a good candidate is, right? So, um, absent a big public outcry, absent people coming into this room and complaining about it, and in the absence of data that would cause us to change it, I come out, leave it alone, stay where we are. May I? Go ahead. You guys were nice enough to allow me to start. <laughs> See I, what you did? I'm persuaded by the discussion, uh, and I would support this motion to leave it as it is. I would want to have this discussion, which I think was very good for a small I think it was a good discussion. I would love people to see it. And I'd love the school board, who's our elected officials, Tom's point to be given the powers, including with respect to potentially the stipend, to open the door, to do more work in this area, to collect the data. If these things can be fixed, have the data and call a charter commission. Uh, you know, make the changes. But I am prepared to support this. I want to thank you guys for an unbelievably good and, and Tracy for stepping up to the yeah. table. So I. I've learned a lot with this. Clint. Uh, the nice thing about this amendment is we don't have to get the voters to approve it. Yep. <laughs> exactly right. Just a thought. <laughs> well, and, and to that point, to, when you put a question on the ballot, I know that we've had witnesses say, just put it on the ballot, let them vote. Number one, we, I think our lawyer is going to tell us, don't have too many questions. Mm -hmm because people start getting overwhelmed and think it's bureaucracy. And number two, this could be a flashpoint. For all we know, the reason people haven't really made this a big issue, they like it. <laughs> and maybe we could cause more trouble than good, but that doesn't mean that a good school board elected to do its work could say, we can improve to the goal that Bill Bond right. said. So I'm, I'm ready. I, okay. I, I have to tell you, I am absolutely torn. Um, there are reasons why I think that two consecutive uh, ward district voting creates a situation that could be a, a future danger 
to this community and to this school board and to public education. Now, I, mean, I don't want to be a fear monger, but, but it's happened, and it's happened close by. And if you watch things, you'll know that it's happened here in New Hampshire. And that, you know, I guess maybe I looked at the January 6th things and see them now described as a political discourse, and yeah, I'm saying, no, it wasn't, it was insurrection. Uh, and, and so I, I've been affected by all that. But on the other hand, in defense of myself, I'm afraid that if I voted no tonight to delay the vote, that I would be called a, a racist. And I've lived in this town forever, and my family lives here still, and I will not subject them to that possibility. And therefore, I will vote yes, but it isn't with 100% approval. I say one thing about that, Betty, which is, um, I, by the way, I, I get your point. I don't agree that you would be. Um, that's I do think we have to think a little bit about the fact that this is a pretty responsible city. Mm. We're not talking here, I think, about a town in which people can come in, raise a lot of problems, and create chaos in, a, in the system. Now, that can happen in a lot of different places, and I'm sure it happens in responsible places, but um, I honestly think that if there were a strong movement in this city, just any pick any political issue, whether it's critical race theory or whatever it is, to um, elect members to the school board who advanced a particular cause, that it wouldn't happen here. It's um, now, you know, I didn't think Donald Trump would get elected president either, yeah, so right. take everything I say with a huge grain of salt. But I think, I think it's less likely to happen in Concord. People have been pretty apathetic recently about politics in general and about the school boards. And I think people, know, when you're on the school board, you think everybody knows everything about it when you're off it. You don't know who's on it, and you don't know what's going on. Um, but I do think that we have to keep an eye out for that. And if it happened, I think that that's when you could get a petition going to really shut down some of those things. But yeah. um, so anyway, that's a little bit off the point. But. No, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other last comments before we take the vote? Well, I'll call for the vote. Those in favor of the motion as described will signify by saying yes. 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 Aye. And I as well. Are there any no's? There are no no's. Are there any people abstaining? Good. The motion is passed. Okay. And uh, we're getting to our usual uh, hour where we change over and do the uh, housekeeping. And the first I want to uh, thank Lyndon for uh, several different favors that make those minutes available to us today. Uh, it, a week, uh, a weekly meeting has a, a, a problem for turnaround time. And there have been some problems with uh, community members about uh, the draft minutes and being misquoted and so on. Uh, she's a lady with a velvet touch and managed to, uh, how shall I say, quell all these problems and make the uh, minutes available to us. And so I call now for any errors, omissions, corrections, anything of any kind. If you haven't, speak now, please. Then I will take a motion to accept these minutes from last week, uh, February 8th. Second. I need the motion first. No. Okay. Okay. Kate. <laughs> Kate had I thought, a hand I thought on. Betty just made the motion. You were even <laughs> uh, we can't get too technical. Uh, those in favor of a, uh, accepting the, oh, the minutes will say aye, please. Pays. Yeah, I made the motion. Eight, and I'll Eight second motion. it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now I we go. Actually, here, the people who weren't here probably should abstain. But that's that's why I, I said, I, why don't we have to second yeah, it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Good. Yeah, so everybody said yes. Yes? Yes. 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 Seven, seven. seven. Two abstentions. Two abstentions. Uh, two abstentions. Yes. Okay. And then uh, <laughs> the last item, except for any talk of next week or any concluding remarks, our uh, dear friend, Bill Ottinger has some good news for us. Yes, I, I, uh, I know that, um, that the commission at its last meeting discussed the issue of engaging counsel on behalf of the Charter Commission. And Kate, 
uh, Kate and Bill and I had talked about that. We're tonight that we are looking to hire the firm of Drummond Woodson, and the particular lawyer we're looking at is a young man named uh, Jim O'Shaughnessy. And he has provided uh, uh, an engagement letter, which is signed by him, and it states the rates, uh, which are consistent with the presentation that was made. And this document uh, would be signed, assuming we make a motion to authorize the chair to sign it, and it would become a public document. It would be available in the minutes. Everyone could look at it. Um, it it's exactly as it was presented uh, in the meeting. So I would just move that we authorize the chair to execute and deliver this engagement letter back to Jim, and then a follow-up motion. Okay. You've heard the motion. Uh, is there a second? Thank you, Nancy. Uh, is there any discussion? Uh, I'd just yes. like to thank the three of you for that. Uh, yeah. you know, when I heard the presentation last week, it yeah, you know, no. solidified that these aren't done easy. Your homework well, and, uh, and it sounds like a good fit for us. And uh, thank you. These, these aren't easy tasks, and they're ones that are made harder by the pandemic and, and various things that interfere with our uh, normal uh, ways of communicating. And so, yes, um, we all thank you. Thank you very, I very much. I would just note that we did talk to some other, to at least one other lawyer, and I have called that person to indicate that um, we, we are sorry, but we're going to use somebody else. And you know, as a matter of courtesy, I think we should have done that, so we have. Okay, I think it's pretty clear that uh, we got by uh, motions, the uh, connected motions, 10, 11, and 2. We vote on oh. this motion. Oh, oh you had a second thing? I'm the, sorry. No, 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 the motion on this. Okay, we didn't good. vote. Oh. So the motion is to authorize Betty, and I know oh. that sounds overly oh. detailed, but we should do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For those in favor would say aye, please. Aye. 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 Okay, it's official. And so then, and looking forward to next week, the 22nd. Is that George's birthday? Uh, George Washington, that is. Uh, he, we were good friends. Yeah, yeah. I knew that he had wooden false teeth. Uh, that's how well I knew him. Uh, at any rate, uh, when we take up next time, it'll be after uh, on the list uh, of motions that originally uh, were, were passed. And we're, you know, I think folks were rounding second and approaching third. We've got a ways to go before we get home. But this was magnificent work tonight, hard work, hard work. And, and people had great ideas, and also they were so honest. This is difficult work. This is very hard. You have to be, you have to parse your words, you have to be careful, you have to be honest, and doing all those things at the same time is absolutely critical, and you came through with flying colors. So unless there are some Closing remarks, Clint. I just have a question for Bill, um, our attorney. Yes. I'd like to have come. him come, and we can ask him some pertinent questions about procedures and stuff. Do you think he could come? I think I asked him about that. I think he's available for next week if it well, fits the we'll, chair. We'll, we'll put that chair. on as a strong maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Would it, good. Could I just make? Would it make sense for us to get through? our motion so that we have everything finished before we have a further conversation with the lawyer. In other words, we know what might, but we know what we're likely going to recommend to be on the ballot. Would that make sense? Well, is he only going to come once? No, but um, I just want to use his time wisely. And well, uh, here's where some of the questions I want to ask, or at least one of the questions. Now that we've solved the, uh, uh, the, the ward voting, um, uh, the part about anything we do want to change being on the ballot. Now, I want to say uh, uh, next week I'm going to put a vote up that we eliminate the language in this charter that says our our board members are compensated the same as the city council. Right. Does that have to be on the ballot or can we just do that? No. That's a great question to ask the lawyer. Well, that's why I wanted to. Like, I, I think to introduce no, him in person. I would be great and and in fact i if it's okay with all of you i could interface with them say i'd like you to come 
we may prepare him a little bit, give him some background yeah. Yeah. and things yeah, like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so that he, and if anyone has a particular legal question that's been gnawing at you, amendment versus revision. Yes. Dr. Cogswell. Yes. That's <laughs> what I've been thinking about that one. We yeah. could ask him and have him prepared, yeah. and you can ask the question, and it'll be efficient. So I, I actually, Betty, I was going to raise a similar question, not so much related to the lawyer, but this issue of whether with ward voting you have to live in your ward is not part of the charter. So it feels to me like that we ought to we ought to try to get some guidance on whether that's something that can be addressed without addressing it in the charter. That is that the school board could make a decision um, on the criteria that they want to apply if someone leaves someone who's been elected from a ward no longer lives in that ward. I, I don't think it's a, it's not a matter of our charter now that if you move out of the city of Concord, you have to leave the, you, you have to resign from the board. Now the city yeah. or the ward bill? If you move out of the city, you have to resign the board. But, but where is this? not in the charter, is it? But no, it's but it's in the policy. It's a policy. Okay, but, that, but that's, you prove my point. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which is exactly. Yeah. And there's a confusing, and I saw you guys have a great discussion, a very confusing use of the word it's district. It is. That, yes. that is something that I think this is a really good question to work with uh, the lawyer on clarifying. Because I, I, and it sounds like there's substantive discussion left on that issue from what I saw on yeah. YouTube. Well, then we'll leave it this way. If you can give him a little bit of a heads up yes. on the two or three items that have already come up tonight, and then you know we'll find out everything. We'll pick his brain for as long as we can, and then if we need to have him back, we'll yeah. have him back because yeah. we have uh, two meetings in March and two meetings. In Bill, did you have a follow-up motion? No, no, no it was. A follow -up motion? The attorney, I thought you said. It was only to ask the group oh, okay. Uh, okay. whether he should come, mm -hmm. and can I, do you mind if, yes. if the three that of us great. reach out and kind of prep them a little bit? Mm -hmm. And so that was a, not a motion, okay. just a, a point, but thank you very much. Yeah, no, okay. Keep, keep up the good work. Uh, at this point, unless someone has else, something to add. I move uh, to adjourn. Move, we adjourn. Second. There's a second from Nancy, a motion from Bill. All those in favor will say aye, please. Aye. 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 Thank you so much. It was a very productive and important meeting.